if we embrace gospel centrality as being intentionally or robustly Trinitarian, as being intentionally expositional in our philosophy of preaching, if we take it to mean that we're going to be relentlessly missional in our posture towards the culture and thoughtfully liturgical in how we practice our gathered worship, and if we're going to always be pursuing community, if this is what we mean by being a gospel-centered church, then how should the city of Chattanooga experience us? And the answer I keep coming back to that question is this. They should experience us as being scandalously hospitable. Scandalously hospitable. Perhaps that sounds strange to your ears, but we see it throughout the New Testament and we see it specifically at the center of the text that was just read for us. The text says, as Jesus was having a meal in Levi's home, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who were following him. So as this message was coming together, I was thinking through what to title it. And I quickly scratched through some ideas. I decided against Jesus at dinner with sinners. I quickly passed on Jesus and the sinner's lair. And I thought Jesus, or rather Jesus' sinner dinner, probably also didn't quite communicate what I was hoping to. So this morning I settled on a title with a nod to Jonathan Edwards and his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. The title of our message this morning is Jesus in the Home of a Greedy Sinner. Perhaps the title makes you uncomfortable. As Westerners who are inclined towards politeness and niceness, and as Southerners who have taken that deeply into our culture, It's too easy to gloss over the stark, harsh realities, the uncomfortable realities of this text. Realities like Levi was a tax collector and Jesus is sharing a meal with tax collectors. So we're going to look at this text from four different angles in order to wrestle with what we see and what we see is Jesus in the home of a greedy sinner. So let's look at this text from four different angles. First, there are four settings in this text. If you notice, as Carlos read, Mark moves rapidly as he writes his gospel from one episode to another. So in these few short verses, we're in four different places in a few short verses, four different settings. First, Jesus is by the sea. This is the Sea of Galilee, It's a large, fresh body of water in Israel prized for its fishing. And much of Jesus' ministry takes place along the coastline of this sea. Immediately before our text, Jesus had healed a paralytic man and had caused quite a stir in that particular city. But Mark tells us immediately that Jesus went from that home and he's at the shoreline. So he's left the location of the healing and now he's walking along the shoreline, but he's not picking up seashells. He's teaching the people. This is a mobile classroom of sorts. He's a teacher on the move. But immediately the scene changes again from the seaside to the tax booth. You see, Capernaum was on a trade route from Damascus to Galilee. So of course there was a tax booth. All of the goods that were leaving or entering must be taxed for the Roman Empire to survive. So the mobile classroom of Jesus is making its way from the seashore back into the city. And so Jesus passes by a tax booth. Our translation says tax office, but that's probably not the most helpful translation. We shouldn't picture an H&R block at a busy intersection like we might find in Red Bank or Hickson. Maybe a better image is a toll booth, a manned toll booth. 
Growing up in New England, it seemed like you couldn't move from one city to another without coming across one of these little booths that you had to stop and roll your window down and toss 50 cents or 75 cents into this little container and it would quickly count it and then the gate would go up and you could make your way through. Now, obviously, apart from the modern day coins and mechanism, it would be something similar to this. Goods were coming into the city and Whoever was manning the tax booth would assess the goods and receive a tax before allowing goods in and out. So this tax booth is located in a very busy part of the city, and the man inside knows the coming and going of everyone there. He has an eye on all the merchandise in and out, and he's going to make him pay. His name is Levi. Now, we'll get to him in just a moment. Jesus has actually a pretty significant interchange with him, a life-changing conversation. But before we get there, or rather, before we talk about Levi, before we know what's happening in the text, the scene has shifted again. So from the seashore to the tax booth to the table side, because Jesus is now in Levi's house and he's eating with a tax collector. And a group of people take issue with this, and all of a sudden, as Mark tells the story, the scene subtly shifts yet again as Jesus speaks. Because Jesus takes us from the seashore to the tax booth to the table side, but then as he talks, he takes us to a hospital bedside. Jesus compares himself to a doctor tending to people who are sick. More on that in just a moment. So four scene changes in five short verses. And in those five short verses and four scene changes, we're introduced to three groups of people. So let's look at the text through the lens of these three groups of people. First, we have the crowds. The crowds are fickle in the Gospels. You're never quite sure who they're going to support and whose side they're going to be on. One moment they're for Jesus, and the next minute they're ready to stone him. One minute they're awed by a healing. The next minute they are crying for his death. But in our text, the crowd seems to be functioning simply as observers and not much else. But there's a second group of people. These are the overtly non-religious people of our text. It's a group made up of tax collectors and sinners. Now, ironically, the term sinners would have been sufficient to describe any group of human beings. But Mark wants us to know that this group includes the worst of the worst in the eyes of the religious culture of his day. In this culture, the religious aristocracy had set up boundaries, markers, so that the entire society could know who was in and who was out. And it was very evident who was in. And it was very, very evident who was out. Who is pure? Who is impure? And the sinners mentioned in this case were most likely those who lived without any regard for what the religious aristocracy said ought to be the boundaries of who's in and who's out. And Mark doesn't want you to miss this point as you read. In fact, it kind of gets annoying. Verse 15, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with Jesus. When the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? The repetition is not simply to increase the word count of the book of Mark. The repetition is intentional. He's driving home a point. Jesus is with people the religious aristocracy thinks Jesus ought not to be with. Now, tax collecting isn't exactly a beloved profession in any context. We can just name that reality. But the IRS agents of today might as well be Girl Scout cookies selling cookies for all... Girl Scout cookies selling cookies. Girl Scouts selling cookies for all the goodwill they generate in comparison 
to a tax collector in first century Galilee and Judea. Now, Levi wasn't a chief tax collector like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Climbed up a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. He was a chief tax collector. Now, Levi is just a tax collector. You see, the chief tax collectors would actually bid, make bids to the Roman government to win the contract to collect the tax for a given region. And they would have to pay that bid up front once they won it. They would then hire tax collectors to collect the tax that they said they could collect when they won the bid. So Levi was one of these hired tax collectors by a chief's, chief tax collector. So it was Levi's job not only to collect X amount of taxes, but to make up for whatever his boss spent to win the bid and to earn as much as he could for them on top of that. It was an invasive job, a job that of necessity inconvenienced the merchant class, the blue collar class, if you will. The taxes themselves were set by the Roman government, but the tax collectors could find all sorts of less than honest ways to increase their collection amount, accepting bribes, overvaluing goods for higher sales tax, etc. Now, if you add to that the fact that Rome is the unwelcome dominant power over Israel that has subdued the Jewish people, you have tax collectors that are now viewed as traitors by their kinsmen because they're in league with the Roman Empire. They are treated like traitors to their nation. It might be like a Frenchman collaborating with Germany after Paris has fallen during World War I. Collaborator. The culture said that tax collectors were greedy traders, interested only in their profit, and willing to sell out their own people to make a buck. So, they were shunned, avoided, hated, and despised. So we ought to be a bit surprised in the middle of our text to read, Jesus was having a meal in Levi's home. Levi was a tax collector. Jesus is in the home of a greedy sinner. But he isn't just in the home, he's sharing a meal with Levi. And not just with Levi, but with all of Levi's friends, all of his relational network. You see, a meal in this context was more than just sharing food. Meals were ceremonies. Your status in society, in the community, was made legitimate. It was affirmed by who you ate with. And in contrast, whom you ate with could delegitimize and call into question your status in the broader community. And here, Jesus is ignoring that whole superstructure, the superstructure of what is culturally acceptable, and he's legitimizing and affirming in his community the place of the least likely individuals. And church, isn't that us? Aren't we the least likely individuals to be in fellowship with Jesus? There's a song that we'll learn at some point. It goes like this. I am one of those at the table not invited. And to all here at the feast, it's very plain. I cannot hide an etiquette and conversation, but Christ himself sent word, and so I came. I am one of those who was dead and fully buried, and I still bear every stigma of decay. There's no way I can hide what I've just been through. 
Because when Jesus called me, I came fresh from the grave. Though the world may number me among the foolish, I think Jesus Christ is all I need to know. Jesus suffered and paid blood to buy the lowest of the low. Hallelujah, amen, that's me. I'm one of those. Church, we're no different than the tax collectors. We're just like the sinners in this text. But Jesus himself has invited us to his table. He has affirms, affirmed our place in his community. He legitimizes our place in his society. Then and now, Jesus is upending cultural norms. His kingdom is an upside down kingdom. So we've got four scenes. We've got three groups of people, but there are really two individuals at the heart of this text. First, there's Levi. Remember him? Of course you do. How could you forget? He's part of the corrupt tax farming bureaucracy. You might know him as Matthew, the guy that wrote the first book of the second half of your Bible. It's actually easy to overlook him in this text, but he's actually at the center. You have the crowds and the religious leaders bookending this episode, and at the center you have this incredible table fellowship happening right in Levi's home. Because Levi has left the tax booth and he's followed Jesus. No, let's be very, very clear here. Levi's life has been unalterably changed. One simple conversation, not even a conversation as it's recorded here, one simple statement from Jesus to him, and his life has been upended. Jesus says, follow me. And this was not some random selection. Oh, that guy might do. No, Jesus knew Levi, was going to Levi, and called Levi. But Levi has this network of individuals that he's worked closely with day in and day out. They've helped one another out of scraps, perhaps. Who knows? Maybe they even went to tax collector conventions together and traded tax collecting swag. I don't know. Maybe they stood in for one another when one was too ill to collect taxes in his particular region. But whatever bound them together, they were bound together at least by this fact. They are not in the in crowd. They are most definitely the out crowd. The despised, the overlooked, the crowds, the in crowd love to hate. But in this text, Jesus is among them, legitimizing their station in the society he's building, affirming their place in his community. That's the funny thing about this story. It's about Levi and his tax collecting friends and sinners, sort of. And it's about frustrated religious people. We'll get to them in just a moment, sort of. But it's really about this unremarkable, remarkable man, Jesus. This Galilean carpenter who's teaching crowds, moving from place to place, healing people, calling individuals to himself, and affirming the least likely individuals in his community. This obviously holy man, this great teacher who's willing to insult even the most religious sensibilities in order to call to himself despised, overlooked, hated local traders. Even calling one of them to be his disciples. And in so doing, what is he actually doing? He's reaching an entire portion of the population that had been written off. There's something scandalous here 
about Jesus' associations. And quite honestly, the religious people in our text just can't handle it. Like, it's too much for them. Somehow they get wise that Jesus not only called Levi to follow him, but that he then went to his home and that he's eating with them. I mean, it's a small town. Everyone knows what everyone's doing. But Jesus? Right, the teacher? No, he called Levi to follow him and no. He's at his house? He's eat. He's eating with him? And he's eating with his friends? Friends, the scandal in this text is really good news for you and for me. If there's hope for the likes of Levi and his friends to be a legitimate part of Jesus' community, then there's hope for you. And there's hope for me. Maybe you walked in this morning feeling cast off, a leftover, a forgotten part of society, overlooked, shunned, ignored. And maybe part of you even agrees with your culture's assessment of you. But friends, the text brings to you this knowledge. You are welcomed by Jesus in the community of Jesus. He legitimizes and affirms your place in this community. And entrance into this community is both very simple and extremely difficult. How so? Well, let's continue the story because we have to talk about the religious people. All the religious people have just one question. Why? Jesus, why would you risk sullying your good name? Why would you risk improper associations? Why would you risk exploding any influence you could have on the movers and shakers of society by sharing a meal with the likes of them? Why would you affirm them as having a place in any polite society, any legitimate community? But before we get too upset at the Pharisees, and before we start pointing fingers at them, can we just acknowledge that we can be just like them? Whether we realize it or not, it's part of our fallen human nature to otherize people. It's part of our brokenness to separate ourselves out, at least mentally and inwardly, from whomever we don't believe reaches our standard of polite company or appropriate associations. And it doesn't have to do with ethnicity necessarily. It doesn't have to do with politics necessarily. It might. But there are so many ways we otherize people and set ourselves off as in the legitimate part of society versus those who are not legitimately a part of society. So let me ask you this question. Who is the type of person or the group of people you have the hardest time having compassion on or wanting to associate with? If we're being honest, we all have at least one answer to that question. So each of us, to some degree, can identify with the Pharisees' indignation in this text. And so to a Jesus who assaults our association sensibilities, we ask, why Jesus? Why are you willing to share a meal with these sorts of people, the people we overlook, look down on, despise, and sometimes even love to hate? And Jesus answers us, and his critics in verse 17. When Jesus heard this, 
he told them, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. So we come down to one conclusion, four scenes, three groups of people, two individuals, and one conclusion. We could state it, or we could state as the governing principle of the mission of Jesus this way. The sick need a doctor, not the healthy. Jesus delights to enter into the lives and spaces of people who are a mess and who know it. And he offers healing that surpasses any medical treatment, a healing that sinks all the way into the core of a human being, to the immaterial part of a man or a woman, that hidden out of sight part, that ugly, twisted, unignorable part. And when Jesus provides the healing, like with Levi, they are never the same. To be affirmed by Jesus as having a place in his community, all it takes is to simply own your need to be healed and then to own him as your healer. It's both simple and extremely difficult. In other words, Entrance into his community looks like following Jesus like Levi did, leaving your sin and your shame behind you and finding in Jesus the doctor you always knew you needed. The physician who alone can heal the most deep, broken places within you. I wonder, friends, if we hear those words as good news. The religious people of Jesus' day did not. To themselves, they seem to be the healthy ones. And so it is today, unfortunately. The most religious about a cause, the most fervent in a crusade in our society, often view themselves as the healers of society. They have the answers. They aren't sick. But in our text, Jesus says to them, in effect, I didn't come for you. You think you're healthy. You you think you don't need what I have to offer. So I didn't come for you. I came for those who are so spiritually sick, they can't hide it. Let's illustrate for a moment. Do you remember COVID? It's a joke, by the way. Much of the controversy surrounding restrictions had to do with this question. What should the healthy do with those who are also healthy during a pandemic? Of course, those who are sick, you quarantine and isolate so they don't spread, but What should healthy people do with healthy people during a pandemic? And different states and different governors and different municipalities had different answers to that question. In our text, the controversy is the opposite. What ought the spiritually healthy do with the spiritually sick? Those who viewed themselves as spiritually healthy thought they had it all figured out. You avoid and shun the spiritually sick. You set them outside the bounds of polite society. You make sure everyone knows that they're not in, and you do your life in the in society, and you push them out. The irony of the human condition, though, is this. There are no spiritually healthy people. Period. We all need a doctor. Now, there are some who think they are healthy and refuse the doctor, and there are some who celebrate their unhealth and wallow in it. And then there are others, others like, well, Levi and his friends, who are willing to own their unhealth and then follow the physician, Jesus. And that's why in this text, We celebrate when we see Jesus in the home of a greedy sinner. 
So sojourn, what does this mean for us? Well, the governing principle for Jesus in his mission was the sick need a doctor, not the healthy. So Jesus went to the sick. And the governing principle for us in our mission as Sojourn Community Church, located in Hill City, Chattanooga, Tennessee, as we follow Jesus, our mission, our governing principle and mission ought to be this. The sick need an introduction to the doctor. And we who are sick ourselves and have been introduced to the doctor, we need to be scandalously hospitable to give others an introduction to that same glorious physician. So church, are we willing to be scandalously hospitable in our relationships with the culture at large? as we joyfully stand on truth with conviction, will we simultaneously invite into our homes and spaces those the world says we shouldn't be friends with because they disagree with us? Will you as a family be willing to truly welcome into this space and into your home the sort of person that your upbringing and your family of origin would have said didn't deserve your time or your attention or your compassion. And let's just go there. As the 2024 political season winds up, aren't you excited? And as your friends and fellow church members begin posting articles and opinions about local and national matters, Are you willing to be scandalously hospitable and generous with them, even if they disagree with you? Or do you expect everyone you worship with on Sundays or everyone you gather with in your life group to check the same boxes you do on a certain Tuesday in November every two years? The kingdom of Jesus is an upside-down kingdom. And with all the talk in our society of inclusion and tolerance and leveling the playing field, can we just call out that the emperor has no clothes? Society at large is the main enforcer of unbreakable social barriers and uncrossable social lines. But as the church, like Jesus, We welcome into our lives people that will never improve our cultural social mobility in order to gift them an experience of gospel love. In order to speak gospel grace into their lives. In order to give them an introduction to Jesus. And friends, that is what the church is supposed to be scandalously hospitable. And only the gospel frees us into living in this way. A way that is reckless in the true sense of not caring about the societal cost or consequence. The gospel message that says God the Father by the Spirit saves sinners and restores his creation through the perfect life, sacrificial death, and bodily resurrection of Jesus, that gospel message allows us to say there is no one who is spiritually healthy, including us. We are all in the same boat. We are all sick. So let me introduce you to Jesus. He's the one who came for sick sinners the only truly perfectly spiritually healthy one who would end up giving his life for us. So, how will Chattanooga experience sojourn as a gospel-centered church on mission if they never show up to hear an expositional message on Sunday morning? If they never experience our intentionally thoughtful liturgy on Sunday morning? 
or if they never understand the Trinitarian nature of God, God as Father, Son, and Spirit. Well, as a church, let's pray that our city, our neighbors, our coworkers, our fam- friends and family, that they will experience sojourn as a gospel-centered church on mission through our scandalous hospitality. And who knows? Maybe Jesus will just show up in someone's life and call another Levi into his kingdom to follow him. Because that is why he came. Let's pray together. Father, in a few moments, we will come to the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in very tactile, sensory ways, remind ourselves that we are welcomed by Jesus into his family. Father, thank you. Thank you for calling us to yourself through the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that week by week you would send us out from this gathering as a church into the various spheres of influence that you've called us to, into our relational networks of fellow sick human beings and in scandalously hospitable ways invite them into our lives to experience acts of gospel love coupled with joyful declaration of gospel facts so that Jesus Christ might be seen to be the glorious Savior, treasure that he is. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.